First, I will deal a bit with my journey in life. And secondly, I want to identify a number of challenges to which I think you young people are confronted. It is a great pleasure for me to address the youth delegates at this Nobel Peace Laureate Summit in Merida. I have no doubt that one of the central challenges of your generation, will uh, which your generation will confront, will be the management of enormous changes that you will experience during your lifetime. You will need very special leadership skills to deal with change because change is accelerating, it is unpredictable, and it is fundamental. During the past century, and particularly since World War II, there has been an exponential acceleration in the pace of change. Our society has changed more during the past 10 years than it did in the first 10,000 years of our development as a species. It is interesting to note that the front hand actions that were made by our ancestors Homo erectus one and a half million years ago were indistinguishable from the hand actions that they were still making a half a million years ago. For a million years, there was no advance in our technology. Today, it is impossible for any single individual to keep track of the technological process that we make in just one year. And any of these changes might affect our future as dramatically as the hand axe did one and a half million years ago. Change is also unpredictable. Some of the main developments that have fundamentally transformed the world were entirely unforeseen only 35 years ago. Think of the internet and mobile phones, the collapse of the Soviet Union and international communism and AIDS. The change that we are experiencing is also fundamental. It affects almost every aspect of our lives. It is changing the relationships between men and women husbands and wives, and parents and children. It has profound implication for the traditional family. 40% of mothers in Europe are now unmarried. More than half Europeans state that they do not belong to any religion. Change is affecting our value systems and traditional concepts of morality. It will continue to transform the way we work the way we spend our free time, and the way we communicate and obtain information. I would like to share some perspectives with you about the historic change process that we South Africans have had to manage during the past 30 years. I would also like to talk about the leadership qualities that change management requires. I'm often asked, whether the decision that I took after I became in September 1989 to end apartheid and to transform South Africa was the result of, of some or other Damascus Road experience. It wasn't. Neither was it a sudden change in direction. It was, in fact, the combination of a long process of introspection and reform that started in 1978 when my predecessor became Prime Minister. Introspection and acceptance of the need to change are the first steps in the process of transformation. Resistance to change is deeply ingrained in all of us. We fear the unknown and dread the prospect of moving into uncharted waters. In our case in South Africa, the whites and other minorities had well-grounded reasons for, to fear change. We feared that change would need, would end our right to self-determination, which had been the driving force of my people, the Afrikaners. 
for more than 150 years. We were deeply concerned, deeply concerned about our place as a minority in a new non-racial South Africa. But nevertheless, by the beginning of the 80s, it was becoming increasingly clear that we were on the wrong course, that apartheid was wrong, that it has put us in a place which was morally indefensible. We also realized that we were being drawn inexorably into a downward spiral of conflict and of isolation. And we spent a great deal of time coming to terms with the realities of our situation and wrestling with the need for fundamental change. For me, the key point was simply the realization that the policies that we had adopted and that I had supported as a young man had led to a situation of manifest injustice. I was a member of a cabinet committee that wrestled with the need for transformation. By 1986, we had accepted that all South Africans, regardless of race, would have to be accommodated within the same constitutional system. Then, ladies and gentlemen, having accepted the need to change, the next challenge was to avoid the, temptance, the temptation of pretending to change. Very often, countries, companies, and individuals who know they must change bluff themselves and pretend to change. For years, we white South Africans also fooled ourselves that we could reform apartheid and thereby avoid the traumatic decisions and risks that real change always involves. It was only when we accepted that we would have to take extremely uncomfortable decisions and uncomfortable risks that real change could begin. The next challenge was to articulate a clear and achievable vision. In my first speech after my surprise election as leader of the ruling National Party in February 1989, I made it clear that we intended to embark on a process of transformation. I then said, our goal is a new South Africa, a totally changed South Africa, a South Africa which has rid itself of the antagonism of the past, a South Africa free of domination or oppression in whatever form, a South Africa within which the democratic forces, all reasonable people, align themselves behind mutually acceptable goals against radicalism, irrespective of where it comes from. And then on the 2nd of February 1990, I presented a new vision to the South African Parliament of a peaceful and democratic solution to our problems. I set goals that included a new and fully democratic constitution, the removal of all forms of discrimination and domination, equality before an independent judiciary, the protection of minorities as well as of individual rights, freedom of religion and universal franchise. And by 1994, after many crises, we South Africans, had adopted a new constitution that achieved virtually all of these objectives. The first requirement, ladies and gentlemen, of leadership is to actually become a leader. And this is never easy. History awards no prizes to people who have the right answers. The world is full of armchair experts. The art in the first place is to succeed in the very arduous process of becoming a leader. You needn't be the leader of a country, you can be the leader of an organization. You can be the leader of a civil society organization. Only then, when you become a leader, can you really have an impact on events and steer them into what you believe is the right direction. 
history recognizes only those who have the ability to translate their vision of what is right into reality. A leader must have a weather eye open for changes in political tides and currents. He or she must also be ready to ride the wave of history when it breaks. After I became president, my hand was greatly strengthened by the historic events that were occurring in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. The collapse of international communism helped us to allay fears of Soviet expansionism in Southern Africa. And by February 1990, we were ready to launch our transformation process. Change leadership also requires accepting calculated risks. We realized that our decision to embark on a process of transformation would involve enormous risks and unleash a chain of events with far-reaching and unpredictable consequences. At times, it was rather like paddling a canoe onto a long stretch of dangerous rapids. You may start the process and determine the initial direction. However, after that, the canoe is seized by enormous and often uncontrollable forces. And all that you can then do is to maintain your balance, to avoid the rocks, and to steer as best as you can. And if the canoe capsizes, to put it upright again. It is a time for cool heads and firm and decisive action. By following this approach, we South Africans were able to manage the very difficult transformation of our society. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> But what about your generation? What changes will you encounter on your journey to the future? Strangely enough, the best way to predict the future might be to identify the broad factors that have driven the history of mankind in the past. The first of these factors is climate change. <coughs> Mankind really came to the fore when it had to survive recurrent ice ages, the last of which ended a mere 12,000 years ago. Today, we are confronted <coughs> with irrefutable evidence of global warming, which if left unchecked, could contribute to catastrophic climate change. We must face the undeniable reality that the present rate and nature of human development is unsustainable. There are simply too many of us and too few resources to go around. A series of only three or four bad harvests caused by global warming could plunge much of the world into famine. Whatever else happens, future human development will take place within a framework that will be treated by our deteriorating environment, that will be created by our deteriorating environment. The environment might well prove to be the single most important determinant of our future during the coming century. Your generation is absolutely right to be deeply concerned about climate change and to raise your voices for concerted action by governments to protect the world and the environment that you will inherit. The second factor that will determine our future will be demographic. Much of human history has been driven by the movement of people. 
the first successful migrations from Africa between 100,000 and 70,000 years ago led to the population of most of the planet, to the extinction of our main competitor, the Neanderthals, and in effect, to the beginning of history. Much of mankind's history during the past 3,000 years has been driven by migrations. Migrations of tribes from Central Africa against the ramparts of the Roman Empire. Migrations of the Huns and the Mongols across the Eurasian landmass. And the huge migrations from Europe after the 16th century, which dramatically changed the history and demography of much of the planet. These migrations shaped the history of my country and also of Mexico and all the countries of the Americas and Australasia. Populations in many parts of the first world have started to shrink. People are living longer and longer with fewer and fewer productive workers to sustain them. Fertility rates in Europe at only one and a half children per woman are way below sustainability. To maintain its present population, it is estimated that Europe will have to attract tens of millions of immigrants by 2050. Current fertility rates mean that in some countries, by the time your generation is in its 60s, children may comprise only one-tenth of the population. At the same time, there has been a substantial increase in life expectation. A child girl born in Japan today can expect to live until she or he is 107 years old. However, rapid advances in medical technology could well extend life expectation beyond 110, with enormous implications for the nature of the societies in which your generation will live. Everywhere, immigrants and refugees are on the move, and populations are becoming more diverse. The dominant image of our time may be the hundreds of thousands of people who are desperately trying to sail across the Mediterranean Sea in search of a better life in Europe, and those who are crossing Mexico in their attempt to enter the USA. The days of the single nation states are gone. Two thirds of the world countries now have minorities comprising more than 10% of their populations. One of the central challenges in the emerging multicultural world will be the accommodation of diversity. Diversity within countries between ethnic, cultural, and religious communities. The distribution of the world's population is also changing rapidly. Before World War II, Europe accounted for more than 20% of the global population. In recent decades, its population has remained static. Now, it's, it represents only 10% and is shrinking, while the population of its predominantly Muslim neighbors in the Middle East and North Africa have quadrupled since 1950. Africa's population will double to two and a half billion during the coming decades. In 2100, when many of you will still be around and alive, Asia will account for 46% of the world's population and Africa for 40%. North and Central America will represent only 7% of the human population. Yet another factor that has traditionally driven human history is technology. Technology is developing, as I've said, at an unprecedented rate. Each new technology 
the further expansion of the internet and information technology, nanotechnology, our ability to decode the human genome and artificial intelligence can have fundamental implications for your generation and for the future of mankind. During the coming 15 years, the world will be changed by new technologies as dramatically as it was by the entirely unforeseen advent of the internet and cell phones during the past 25 years. Now, more than half the people of the world have access to the internet and to the global information and communication resource that it represents. Every day, we now send more than 130 billion emails, probably far more global communication that, than occurred during the entire period before the 18th century. We do not know the game changer what, what the game changer technologies will be, but they might include breakthroughs in the provision of cheap and abundant energy, or the ability to desalinate seawater at a very low cost. They will probably include developments in medical science that might eliminate many of the deadly diseases and prolong life for decades. They will include advances in virtual reality that will make entertainment virtually real and provide an escape from reality for billions of people. The interface with the internet might no longer take place through flat screens, but in three dimensions with the use of holograms. Robots will carry out most jobs far more effectively than humans. Already computers can often give better and cheaper diagnosis than experienced doctors. They can also write contracts and provide legal opinions more effectively than lawyers. As Elon Musk warns, robots will be able to do everything we do and more. His greatest fear is that artificial intelligence may quite soon pose a mortal threat to humanity. This geometric expansion of human knowledge and technology leaves us increasingly with one disturbing conclusion. Virtually nothing is impossible. A fourth historic determinant has been the competition between different systems of organizing human society. If there was any point to the long and tragic story of war and conflict, it may have been to illustrate which approach to government works best in advancing human well-being. In the 17th and 18th century, at the very time when it was conquering much of the rest of the world, Europe produced only 12% of the global GDP compared with the more than 45% generated by China and India. By 1913, following its emergence from the Industrial Revolution, Europe's share of global GDP had risen to almost 30%, while the combined share of China and India had dropped to only 15%. In 2011, the euro area's share had again shrunk to only 17,1%, and the OECD projects that it will decline uh, and, and with the OECD projects, it will decline to only 11% by 2030. Asia is once again returning and resuming the dominant economic role that it has played throughout most of recorded history. One of the main change factors during the coming decades will be the growing competition between the emerging Asian giants, China and India on the one hand, and the USA and Europe on the other hand. The question is,
whether the West's individual freedom-based market system will be able to compete with China's authoritarian state capitalism. So the world, ladies and gentlemen, in which your generation will inherit, which your uh, generation will inherit, will probably be dominated <coughs> by a make or break struggle against climate change. Radically shifting demographics with older and far more multicultural populations. It will be dominated by unimaginable new technologies that will change virtually every aspect of our lives by solving many of mankind's problems and perhaps in so doing create new ones. And it will be dominated by increasing competition between the West and the East with far-reaching implications for Western nations and Western notions of democracy and individual freedom. To sum up, we are being swept along by an unprecedented tide of change that is accelerating, fundamental, and largely unpredictable. The future will be determined by the factors that have driven human development in the past, by climate change, by demographics, by technology and by competition between different systems of organizing society. Your generation will have to manage unprecedented change. And in doing so, it will have to develop very effective leadership skills. I thank you. to answer questions, uh, unfortunately not in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know whether we've got translation uh, capabilities here, but uh, he would be very happy to answer questions, and I see there's a hand right up there on the front row, right at the end of the white shirt. Thank you. Hi, my name is Guillermo Fournier. Hi, my name is Guillermo Fournier, Mr. The Clerk. I have one question for you. How was it when President Nelson Mandela asked you to be his vice president? And do you think this political move was uh, good for the process of reconciliation in South Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I have mine switched on too? <laughs> How do I switch it on? Thank you for the question. Firstly, President Mandela didn't ask me to be his vice president. He had to accept me. <laughs> Our first constitution, we called it an interim constitution, said that for five years there would be a government of national unity and that the party with the second highest votes leader would be one of two executive presidents. My party had the second highest number of votes. I was the leader of my party and therefore we had to accept it. But it was so good for the country. The ANC, the African National Congress of Mandela, had no experience of governance. And in the first two years of that government of national unity, they were wise enough to learn from us who had decades and centuries of experience in governance. Uh, we could build consensus about difficult issues and challenges that the country faced. Actually, I believe if we still had a government of national unity, it would be better for the country than now that we have 
a simple majority rules the country and the ANC has 57% of the vote and therefore they rule. It was a good system and in a multicultural society the accommodation of minorities, the minorities which I represented, which wasn't only white, is an important factor in building peace and in building a consensus about the goals for which one should strive in a country. Front row, red jacket. Uh, it's an honor to meet you, Mr. De Clark. Um, earlier, you mentioned that in order to, in order to make a change or to do what's right, what you think is right. Uh, you need to be a leader, but my question is, how do you know that what you're thinking or what you want to do is the right thing to do? Well, that's really what democracy is about. If you make the wrong choice, the people will reject it. That's why it's necessary to have regular elections. But how, how do you know that you're doing the right thing? by doing deep self-introspection, by being objective, not by being a professional politician, but by regarding politics as a calling. You call to serve, you're not called to build a career. And that is the process through which I personally went. I never regarded myself as a typical politician. I did deep self analysis and deep introspection, I came to the conclusion that the old system failed to bring justice to all the people in South Africa, that I couldn't build the future of my own people on the basis of continued injustice to other people. And because of that introspection, I came to the conclusion I must apologize for the wrongness and the pain that apartheid has caused, and I did so. I never doubted that I was right, because I was trying to rectify the wrongs of the past. Thank you. Third row, white shirt, white shirt. Yep. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Felipe, and at the end of your speech, you talk about leadership skills that the young people need. Actually, I'm the leader of an organization who is trying to develop leadership skills in young people in all around the world. <coughs> but sometimes, sometimes we don't have all the answers about what is the kind of leaders we need to develop for the challenges that the world is facing right now. My question is like, wh what do you believe uh, what are those skills that the young people need to, to face the challenge we are going, to, we are facing now, and we are going to face in the future as youth generation? I think that leadership development should be the focus of many civil society organisations. That firstly they should accommodate as we do at this conference, the youth. From a young age, people, young people should be allowed to have their say, to sit in on discussions, not to be told what to do, but to be involved in consultations about what do we need to do. And that is how leadership then develops. One needn't be a leader to make a difference. If my speech is misunderstood in that regard, anyone can make a difference. You can make a difference in a small circle. You needn't, as I said, be the leader of a country or of a very, very big organization. All of us can make a difference in our immediate vicinity, in our immediate circle of friends, circle of family, circle of family students, <coughs> fellow students, or circle of of fellow workers when we enter the labor market. But leadership, development of leadership skills is important. 
Therefore, although it's never popular at school or at university, debating societies is a good thing. Therefore, it's very important that young people should be not led and told what to do, but should be drawn into decision-making processes. Right at the back there, black shirt. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Cesar. I'm, from, I'm here from I'm from here from Mexico, uh, and I work in peace building. And during my um, research, I've been uh, quite thinking a lot about the concept of sustainable peace. And I wonder if you can share your perspective. Um, for example, in the civic rights movement in the U.S., um, with uh, the struggles of uh, Martin Luther King. In South Africa, with the movement uh, for uh, anti-apartheid, uh, with Mandela and yourself, and in India with Gandhi for the independence of, uh, um, of India from the British uh, uh, rule, um, they all make a lot of uh, sacrifice, and basically it was they were they were trying to fight to uh, for reconciliation, to uh, promote uh, peace and non-violence and to basically live in peace. But all those sacrifices, all those struggles, nowadays uh, seems like they're like, um, they're being um, challenged by the circumstance uh, with nationalism, with uh, again, uh, uh, racism in the US or in, in South Africa or, or in India. And I wonder what we're still missing out there in this uh, struggle, we're still missing out there to for all those sacrifices from Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mandela uh, are not lost uh, in the struggle for reconciliation and to promote uh, peace and non-violence. We're still missing out there in society. There's really no short answer to that, but I think part of it is it's all about values. It's promoting certain values. I'm, there's a place for protest, but I'm not a great supporter of protest. Protest never, protest did not convince us in South Africa to do away with apartheid. It was introspection and the realization of the injustice of apartheid. Yes, the protest helped to keep us on our toes and the sanctions. But in the end, it was conscience driven. Now, values, I say, is fundamentally important. What are the values of peace? Peace is not just the absence of war. Peace is a state of mind. Peace rests upon pillars such as the acceptance of human rights. It rests on the pillars such as the acceptance of the importance of the rule of law, of the acceptance that there is no place in any society for discrimination on the base of race or color or religion or whatever other reason. It rests on the pillar of accepting that my rights are not stronger than the other one's rights and that I must respect the rights of my fellow citizens as I want them to respect my rights. It means striking a balance, therefore, between own rights and the rights of others. So peace is a state of mind which must be promoted by value systems. Now, in many countries, family life has broken apart. Those values ought to be learned in the family as you grow up. It ought to be learned and teach at schools and at institutions of education. And it needs to be lived and advocated by those in leadership positions. So I would say <coughs> the way out of violent conflict is in the end the acceptance of the basic universal values 
which have succeeded throughout history in the world. And then secondly, I would say we need more dialogue and we need more negotiation. There's a tendency that people of different opinions shout at each other. We used to shout at each other in South Africa. And it was only when we as great enemies decided there is no war to be won, we will only ruin the country if we carry on as we were doing, that we sat around the table. And we started out with not the big things we disagree about. We started by making a list on what do we agree with each other. And that made the task much easier because the list was much longer than we expected. And then step by step we started to address the issues on which we more fundamentally disagree. And through give and take, through dialogue and through a process of compromise, we reached a workable compromise which accommodated the interests and the priorities of both sides in the consultations and in the negotiations and in the dialogue. So dialogue, talk to each other, don't shout at each other, and build the values which have proven itself throughout history as those values on which the most successful societies were built. We have time for one more question, and <coughs> right at the very colorful shirt. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Ari Eisenstadt from the University of Hawaii. I want to thank you so much for your inspiring words and work. Um, my question is to your, to your final point around competing political ideology. What do you see as the future of resolving these issues between nations in the most peaceful way possible? Thank you. Again, it affects the essence of democracy. There's room and space for different viewpoints uh, regarding which what you call ideology might be best. I would rather prefer to say which policy would be best. Isms are very dangerous things. Whether it's socialism, whether it's capitalism, whether it's liberalism, if you make an absolute of something, you ignore certain aspects of the truth. There's truth in all the ideologies, all the political ideologies. Hardline capitalism is unfair to the poor, and to those who suffer. Overdone socialism ignores the reality that you need economic growth and you need economic stability and you need investment in order to create jobs and in order to make a prosperous society. Isms should be avoided. But we should never remove the room and space for constructive debate about what policy will be best. I think we need to move towards a merger of some of these isms, these ideologies, and pick out the truthful elements in each and build a new vision of, yes, how can we have a strong growing economy, but how can we also really reach out to the poor? How can we meet developmental needs? How can we meet the, the developmental needs without killing off the goose that lays the golden egg, etc., etc. So, in the end, meaningful compromise is what should be strived for by political leaders in doing the best for the country and its people. Thank you very much.